What's up everybody? Today we're gonna to address a question that many young improvisers might ask themselves. Hey, I learned the modes, why do I still suck? Now, if you feel like this is you or one of your students, hopefully today's lesson will get you thinking about some alternative to working on the modes as we work through kind of the intermediate period as improvisers. So if you're just getting going on improvisation, you probably start working on the blues first and maybe you've got that a little bit together and now you wanna move on to the next concept. Uh, many people think, all right, the modes are probably the next thing that has some scales. That's kind of like stuff I understand, but you might find your solo sounding a little something like this. Now that kind of sounds like jazz, but it's not very satisfying to play and probably not very satisfying to listen to. It doesn't have very good phrasing. There aren't resolution points. It just kind of sounds like I'm wandering around in a key. And that's where many students end up when they work on just the modes without any of the other harmonic material to support them. Now today's lesson is actually gonna be a two-part lesson. We'll do half this week, half next week. There's a lot of material here, so I wanted to break it into two parts so it's a little more digestible. Um, let's start out with today by dealing with some of the common pitfalls that we face when we delve into these modes and possibly some alternatives that might get us better success. All right, pitfall number one. That is that we learn these modes only by what we call parent scales. Now, parent scales are an important theoretical concept, and especially when we talk about understanding harmony as a whole, it's an important thing to understand. However, it is something that if we don't apply correctly and using the right places, it can really lead us in the wrong direction. So what is a parent scale? Now, today we're not gonna delve into all the details of like what a mode is, what the different modes are, but we do need to know about this one concept. So a parent scale is a major scale, or it could be a minor scale, um, that is used to build our other modes on. For example, we're gonna start with C major because it has no flats or sharps, so it's pretty easy to talk about in this way. Um, C major would be the parent scale. Now, if we start on different notes of that key, but we still play in that scale, we are going to create different modes. So for example, if I play C major, now if I start on the second note of the scale, but still just play the same notes, I'm gonna be creating a D Dorian mode. This way of thinking, where we think about a parent scale, C major, and we start on different notes of that, in this case, the second note of the scale, is this concept of parent scales. Now, the problem with this, and what I actually illustrated in that first example that I played, was that it can get students to think about, hey, when I see a D minor chord, I'm really playing in C major, when that's not really true, um, at least in many cases. It can be true in some cases, which we'll talk about um, at the end of lesson two, but in most cases, we really wanna think, hey, I'm in D minor, not in C major when I see a D minor chord. And so for me, I really like to think about these uh, modes in terms of their alterations. For example, Dorian is a major scale with a flat third and a flat seven. So in that case, it would be the F sharp from D major goes to an F natural, the C sharp goes to a C natural. To me, that's a much more effective way to think about the modes. Now, we're not gonna delve all into that kind of stuff in this particular lesson today. All right, using parent scales in maybe not the correct way or not applying them correctly is problem number one. Now, problem number two, when we deal with the modes, is that when we start to work on this material, most of us are trying to get a little more like change playing into our improvisation, meaning that the ideas we play really outline the chords and we can work through different chord progressions that are more complicated. Um, this, I think, largely comes from kind of the bebop style of jazz or that period of jazz. And those musicians, um, they were really playing a relatively ornamented style of music, but it was mostly really based on arpeggios and just diatonic scales, not really necessarily thinking about the modes. And so if we really want to get into sounding like those players, we want to be thinking about how do I create this highly ornamented style on arpeggios, not so much how do I use the modes to help create the chord changes. The final element of why modes can be a little challenging to kind of incorporate in a way that sounds musical is these are not language and none of our theoretical concepts are by themselves, whether we're just thinking major scales, modes, arpeggios, whatever. They um, are there to help us understand the language that has already been created by the jazz masters, not an instruction manual about how to create it. 
Um, so it's very important that we keep that in context in the right way. How do we really want to learn this language? Listening, transcribing, all that type of good stuff. And then we use our theory to kind of look backwards to understand what happened. Um, and then it can inform us moving forward. But if we don't have that context of where it came from, it's really hard to apply this theory in the right way. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, great, Sean, you hate the modes. Okay, whatever, you already know how to play. It's easy for you to say that I'm out here trying to get it together still. So today, we're gonna to talk about what you might wanna practice instead of the modes that will get you where you wanna go. All right, now, as I said, um, when we're trying to learn how to play bebop, we really wanna get connected with arpeggios and how we ornament those. This is the root of this language. Modes usually come after that, in my opinion. So if you are feeling good about the blues and you wanna take it to the next step, next step is to really learn your arpeggios. Now, today, we're going to use the tune Autumn Leaves. This is a great kind of intermediate song. It has two fives and just a couple of key centers. And it's usually played in the key of B flat major or G minor, which is a pretty friendly key for most intermediate players. So for a few of these examples, I'm just gonna worry about the first four bars. That's a two, five, one, then it does go to four in the key of B flat. So our first step would just be to play these arpeggios. Being able to do that nice and smooth and fluently through the whole form, really important just to make sure that information is really firm about how we construct those chords. Now, that is not necessarily super musical. It kind of sounds like a walking bass line, but probably not a very good walking bass line because it has a lot of jumps in it, but it is an important starting place. Once we're feeling pretty comfortable with that, the step we actually want to move to is making these arpeggios into more like an idiomatically appropriate idea or an idea that would kind of fit into a solo. So we're going to change the rhythm a little bit. We're going to play them as eighth notes, and we're going to add an approach note on the end of four leading into each root of the chord. So in this case, we're gonna approach it by a half step below. So for example, the first chord is a C minor chord. Our approach note is gonna be a B natural, and then we land on C on beat one. Now that's outside of the chord. We don't even care. The harmonic ramifications of these approach notes are not a concern of us right now. We're just thinking half step below our target note. So let's check out what that would sound like through the first four measures. <laughs> Cool, so that sounds like an idea that's a little bit more appropriate in a jazz style. All right, that was approach notes from below. We could also do approach notes from above the target note. So this time I'm gonna start a whole step above each root of the chord and do the same exercise. All right, once we're feeling good about that, then we can invert the chord and start to approach the thirds of the chords, then the fifths of the chords, um, and go from there. So here we'll be approaching the third of each chord um, with a half step from beneath the note. Now, once your approach notes are feeling pretty good, the next idea you're gonna to wanna to think about is what's called an enclosure. An approach note approaches the target note and an enclosure encloses the target note, uh, meaning that it goes on either side of it. So if our target note is C, um, in the first measure, I'm gonna play a D flat above and then a B natural below and then land on the C, my chord tone. So let's check out what that would sound like in this example. <laughs> Now these enclosures are all over the place in jazz, and there's actually a couple different ways you could play them. Um, we're not gonna get into all that today. Do some listening, listen for this little gesture. You'll find some little variations depending on which player you're listening to. Now in that example, you heard me play both half steps and whole steps above and below. Um, there's not really a specific rhyme or reason about why I'm choosing which. Other than that, I'm thinking about what is easy to execute on the horn to create a smooth line. For example, in the second measure going to the third measure, the F7 chord going to the B flat major seven chord. Um, I have a C to an A natural to a B flat. Now the measures before that, I did a chromatic approach above the note. There I did a whole step. Um, that's mostly because if I'm playing that and I wanna go uh, to a B natural in seventh, to an A in second, to a B flat, that's probably gonna be a little more difficult to execute than the C. And if I'm actually playing this, I'm probably not thinking about that, but I'm almost sure I would play a C natural there if I was playing this in the context of a real solo. Now, just like our approach notes, we're gonna do enclosures on all the inversions, same thing. So let's check out what that would sound like. All 
right, now we're getting some ideas that actually sound like bebop and actually sound a little closer to playing the changes. And I haven't thought about a mode or a scale. I'm really not even thinking about the harmonic or scalar ramifications of these approach notes or enclosures other than how they relate to my eventual target note. Um, I don't care if they're inside, outside of the chord, as long as I resolve to the target note, that is the important thing. Okay, that's kind of the fundamental exercise of how we get this together. You're gonna to wanna to work this through whatever tune you're working on in as many different inversions, subtle variations as you can stand um, to do this. This is definitely an exercise. Um, in the next lesson, we'll talk about how we take this and actually move it into sounding a little bit more musical. So I hope I'll see you then. Happy practicing.